Here we are now in the 17th chapter to the book of Proverbs. Welcome again, my family and friends. How blessed we are to join together at such a time as this in the word of the Lord. Let us pray and enter in to this study. Father God, we thank you for your love and your mercies. We thank you for the goodness of who you are. We thank you for your wondrous acts and works throughout the earth and that you're continuing to perform and bring forth your perfect will in the hearts of all of mankind, those who love you and even those who have turned their backs on you. You know the beginning from the end. You know who are yours and who are not. And I just pray as we study this 17th chapter of Proverbs together that you would strengthen us, Lord, that you would rise up faith within our hearts, that you would bring forth clarity and discernment that you would speak clearly to us on those things we need to overcome, on those things we need to grow in, and on those things that we can help others with. We praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness and for being with us and for teaching us as only you truly, truly can by the power of your Holy Spirit. Have your way in the name of Jesus Christ. We give you the glory, Yahweh. Amen. Amen. All right. Chapter 17, verse 1. Better a dry crust with peace than a house full of feasting with strife. A prudent servant will rule over a disgraceful son and share an inheritance among brothers. A crucible for silver and a smelter for gold, and the Lord is the tester of hearts. A wicked person listens to malicious talk. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. The one who mocks the poor insults his maker, and one who rejoices over calamity will not go unpunished. Grandchildren are the crown of the elderly, and the pride of children is their fathers. Eloquent words are not appropriate on a fool's lips. How much more are lies for a ruler? Verse 8. A bribe seems like a magic stone to its owner. Wherever he turns, he succeeds. Whoever conceals an offense promotes love. But whoever gossips about it separates friends. A rebuke cuts into a perceptive person more than a hundred lashes into a fool. Verse 11 now. An evil person desires only rebellion. A cruel messenger will be sent against him. Better for a person to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool in his foolishness. If anyone returns evil for good, evil will never depart from his house. To start a conflict is to release a flood. Stop the dispute before it breaks out. Acquitting the guilty and condemning the just, both are detestable to the Lord. Verse 16. Why does a fool have money in his hand with no intention of buying wisdom? A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time. One without sense enters an agreement and puts up security for his friend. One who loves to offend loves strife. One who builds a high threshold invites injury. One with a twisted mind will not succeed, and one with deceitful speech will fall into ruin. Verse 21. A man fathers a fool to his own sorrow. The father of a fool has no joy. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. A wicked person secretly takes a bribe to subvert course of justice. Wisdom is the focus of the perceptive, but a fool's eyes roam to the ends of the earth. A foolish son is grief to his father and bitterness to the one who bore him. It is certainly not good to find an innocent person or to beat a noble for his honesty. The one who has knowledge restrains his words, and one who keeps a cool head is a person of understanding. Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent discerning when he seals his lips. Amen. This concludes the 17th chapter of Proverbs. And I tell you, chapters 15, 16, and now 17, they are really cutting deep, cutting to the quick of my heart. I don't know about you, but I speak for myself. There are some convicting statements, some convicting Proverbs, convicting truth that really digs the core of my heart, especially when it comes to the dealing with speech, dealing with guarding our hearts by guarding our 
words and that our words actually show where our hearts are at in most cases. We see that the one, as we just read the last one of the last verses in verse 27, that the one who has knowledge restrains his words. And one who keeps a cool head is a person of understanding. And in verse 28 to conclude said, even if a fool or a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent, discerning when he seals his lips. How many times have we over, overextended ourselves in our speech? How many times have we spoken far too much when we should have just did more listening or not spoken at all? I raise my hand right now, for I tell you, I have done a lot of over-speaking at times and gotten myself into much trouble. And if only I would have restrained my words, I would have been one who had knowledge. And if only I would have kept cool, headed, and not been quick to temper, then guess what? I would have been a person of understanding. So let us be people of knowledge and be people of understanding who the Lord God is by restraining our words and keeping our spirits under subjection to the Lord our God. Hallelujah. We see much in dealing with the results of a foolish child here. It brings grief to me when having to discipline my children and seeing them going astray or in a wrong path. It does grieve a father's heart. But then I have to think back as well to my parents and how much grief and pain I caused them from my foolishness. And then we have to look now in the spiritual sense that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. How much grief and sorrow have we caused His heart from our rebellion and foolish ways? Let us give mercy as we have been given mercy and give grace as we have been given grace. But also let us discipline our children and do it in God's way. And part of that is in dealing with our speech as it's written in James and all through these Proverbs, being slow to speak, slow to anger, but yet quick to listen. That'll help us with much of our troubles. I love verse 1, though. Verse 1 is beautiful. Better a dry crust with peace than a house full of feasting with strife. We touched on this before a couple chapters back in chapter 15, but let us think about it now. Have we ever had a meal, let's just say with our family, our, our immediate family at home, and there's been quarreling or there's been a disagreement or something has happened where the relationship has been tried and there is not uh, much of a peaceable interaction at that time, whether it be a husband and a wife or children, brother and sister or parents, it, it, that should not be. We as people of God should keep the peace in our homes, should do everything we can uh, to make things right and have amends and to not have our prayers hindered. But yet, in the same sense, we still fall short of the glory of God, even at our best. We are not perfect and we do have interactions that go in the negative direction. So, better a dry crust with peace than a house full of feasting with strife. Better to have something that's not very appealing or appetizable to our bodies to eat with the peace and the atmosphere than to have the greatest luxurious foods and to be among a bunch of people who are bickering and are wicked and are evil. So, I also see greatly in this a contrast of the spiritual and the physical. We could suffer in the physical with a dry crust as long as we have the peace of the Lord by not sinning against Him through quarreling and arguing and complaining. And also, what is a house full of physical food that is, that is just delicious with hearts that are wicked and contemptible to God? Let us think on that for a little bit as we go forward. Because verse 3 tells us plainly that a crucible is for silver and a smelter for gold. They, they try the, the silver and they try the gold. They burn out the dross and make it pure. They take out the impurities to make it pure. But it says the Lord is the tester of hearts. We know through the scriptures that the Lord allows trials. The Lord allows tribulations. The Lord allows suffering and hardship to purify his people, to strengthen his people, that he would use those as means to bring forth humility, bring forth repentance, bring forth change. We have to see it as such. Those negative circumstances, those negative things where everything just seems chaotic and out of control, sometimes those are allowed to get our attention and to get us focused on the right perspective 
of the Lord our God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, and to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh, to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness above all else, trusting that He will provide all things, even peace in the heart and soul, and even that in working through relationships and situations that seem too much for us to handle, and indeed they are. But with God, all things are possible. So let's let him test our hearts. Let's let him strengthen us. Not that we have a say in it anyhow, for he sees our hearts and he will test us. Amen. Number four, and then we'll get into the other studies. I'm not going to go through all these verses, but I will say this on number four. Number four really spoke to me this time today. It says, a wicked person listens to malicious talk or lips of iniquity, lips of sin. And a liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. So if we've been listening lately to that of sinful speech, to that of gossip and slander, do we listen in the name of love? Have we ever found ourselves saying, oh, we'll just, we'll just ride this conversation out. And then an hour goes by and you're like, well, they're not done gossiping. They're not done talking about these people. Guess what? It says that our hearts are wicked if we allow that to happen. And if we pay attention to those who are destructive, tearing people down with slander, and we don't interject, and we don't do something about it, it says that we are liars if we pay attention to such nonsense, because that tells us that the love of the Father is not in us. This is really convicting. So from now on, let us, let us be determined that when somebody comes to us gossiping about somebody else, or comes to us slandering and tearing down somebody else, that we'll have our hearts guarded. That we'll say, no, no, I'm, I'm not into those kind of conversations. I'm not into talking about so, so, so and so and so on and so forth. So I have to be on my way. And we handle things the correct way. And we deal with it in the Lord's way. We don't participate in the gossip. By being a bystander like Pontius Pilate with Jesus' crucifixion, we are guilty. We are guilty by not taking action. So we must say, no, I will not let this go into my ears because it poisons our hearts, gossip, slander, nastiness. We cannot listen to it because if we do, it pollutes our hearts. You might not see it in the moment, but down the road, you're going to see that you are reaping a harvest of rottenness because of what you allowed, what we allowed into our ears and into our eyes and thus into our hearts. Let us be about our Father's business and guard our hearts and not hang around those who are vile, who are wicked, who are liars, who are destructive. No, let us be about the kingdom and righteousness and the glory of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is the day, my friends. Now, entering into the study material, in verse 3 we find that it takes intense heat to purify gold and silver. Similarly, if it often takes the heat of trials, it does often take the heat of trials for the Christian to be purified, which we were just talking about. Through trials, God shows us what is in us and clears out anything that gets in the way of complete trust in Him. Peter says, These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. 1 Peter chapter 1 in the 7th verse. So, when tough times come your way, realize that God wants to use them to refine your faith and purify your heart. Somebody here needs to hear this today, receive this today, believe this today, and thus be encouraged today. So when tough times come your way, my friend, realize that God wants to use them to refine your faith and purify your heart. That's his love for you. Jesus suffered taking on the sins of the world upon himself on the cross that we may be the righteousness in him before Father God. So we need 
to know that we need God's forgiveness, we need God's love, we need God's mercy and grace, and that Jesus paid the price for our sins, the penalty for our sins upon the cross. We all deserve to go to hell. We all deserve to be separated from God. So it is a privilege, it is a blessing when we go through trials that our hearts be purified, that we be made more and more like our blessed Redeemer and Savior, Jesus Christ, who takes away our sins. Amen. Amen. Verse 5. We find that few acts are as cruel as making fun of the less fortunate. But many people do this because it makes them feel good to be better off or more successful than someone else. Mocking the poor is mocking the God who made them. We also ridicule God when we mock the weak, those who are different, or anyone else. When you catch yourself putting down others just for fun, stop and think about who created them. Let us indeed today. There's no room for bullying. There's no room for racism. There's no room for prejudice. There's no room for pompous pride in the kingdom of God. For all such things and people will not inherit the kingdom of God, but will be reserved for the lake of fire and cast into the pit for all of eternity to burn in hell. We need to repent. God sent Jesus to pay the price. If you are in any of those sins today, you can repent today. You can turn from your pride. You can turn from your racism. You can turn from your prejudice. You can turn from your bullying and belittling of others. Today is the day to repent because God is the just judge and the justifier of those who truly believe in him. In verse 8, we see that Solomon is not condoning bribery, but he is making an observation about the way the world operates. Bribes may get people what they want, but the Bible clearly condemns using them. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 8, Proverbs 17, 23, and Matthew 28, verses 11 through 15, God condemns bribery. Verse 9, we see that this proverb is saying that we should be willing to forgive others' sins against us. Covering over offenses is necessary to any relationship. Boy, is that not the truth. Yes, it is the truth. We need to hear this today. It is tempting, especially in an argument, to bring up all the mistakes the other person has ever made. Love, however, keeps its mouth shut. Difficult though that may be, try never to bring anything into an argument that is unrelated to the topic being discussed. As we grow to be like Christ, we will acquire God's ability to forget the confessed sins of the past. Let it be so, Father, we pray in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. In 17, we ask this question, what kind of friend are you? There is a vast difference between knowing someone well and being a true friend. The greatest evidence of genuine friendship is loyalty, loving at all times. We can look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. Being available to help in times of distress or personal struggles. Too many people are fair-weathered friends. They stick around when the friendship helps them and leave when they're not getting anything out of the relationship. Think of your friends and assess your loyalty to them. Be the kind of true friend the Bible encourages. Yes, let us be true friends today. And we know that Jesus says a true friend lays down his life for his friends. And we know that he is the greatest friend because he laid down his life on the cross, even to the point of death for us, that we could know our Heavenly Father through him. So anytime we are sacrificial through Jesus, this is a true sign of a true friend. In verse 22, we find that to be cheerful is to be ready to greet others with a welcome, a word of encouragement, and enthusiasm for the task at hand, and a positive outlook on the future. Such people are welcome as pain-relieving medicine. Now in verse 24, we see that while there is something to be said for having big dreams, this proverb points out the folly of chasing fantasies, or having eyes that wander to the ends of the earth. How much better to align your goals with God's, being the kind of person He wants you to be. Such goals, such as wisdom, honesty, patience, love, may not seem exciting, but they will determine your eternal future. Take time to think about your dreams and goals, and make sure they cover the really important areas of life. 
Yes, let us be invested in wisdom, in honesty, in patience, and in love. And we know that all these, all these enter into our lives when we receive the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we must add faith to these four virtues. But these come in addition to faith. It's beautiful, for the love of God produces faith and love in us, and thus we give that love away. But yet, we must always remain in the faith to grow in love, wisdom, honesty, and patience continually in the spiritual sense that is eternally lasting. Let us make these the most important areas of our lives as they are in the Most High Living God through Jesus His Son. Verse 27 and 28. We see that this proverb highlights several benefits of keeping quiet. Point one, it is the best policy if you have nothing worthwhile to say. Point two, it allows you the opportunity to listen and learn. Point three, it gives you something in common with those who are wiser. Make sure to pause to think and to listen so that when you do speak, you will have something important to say. Praise God. Now, with this, I actually, as we started this discussion and study with these last two verses, 27 and 28, it's beautiful that what's first is last and what's last is first. So, with this being said, though, as I was just reading this study material, it was brought forth into my heart about the, a great example of this is Eliphaz, in the book of Job. So you have three of the friends of Job giving rebuttals and rebukes and correcting him and trying to help him through his, through his great time of need and, and trial. But then these guys are older and wiser. But in the end, this young man, Eliphaz, comes and brings forth some of the wisest words recorded in Scripture. And it's absolutely beautiful and wonderful. I believe you go and check it out for yourself. It would be a great study for you to grow in that, that study in the book of Job. But Eliphaz says some beautiful things to Job. But guess what? He was quiet. He was silent while these other three just continued on and on and on with Job. And as these four had given their speeches and these great orations, he sat by and listened. And he says when he begins to speak that he was the youngest and he didn't want to be disrespectful or out of turn when he spoke. So he spoke last, but when he spoke last, what he spoke was truly wisdom, was truly that led by the Holy Spirit and not of a man and not of flesh. It's powerful to be still, to be quiet, to listen, and then to speak when we have something important to say. But if we have nothing worthwhile to say, let us take heed not to speak at all. With this being said, let us pray that the Lord would help us continually in this. I know I keep praying for our speech. I keep praying for our hearts because it's important. And I need these prayers myself. Please continue to pray for me as I continue to pray for you because we will grow together in the faith. And it's a blessing to be able to pray for somebody else, isn't it? Yes, it is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for correction. We thank you for bringing forth our hearts before us and showing us where we need strengthened, where we need help, where we need do a better job at following you and surrendering to your ways and your will. I confess, Father, my speech has not been the best, that I have not always spoken that which was edifying and lovely, that I have not always spoken out of a clear head. And I just ask for anybody like me here today that you would forgive us, Father, that you would cleanse our tongues and our hearts, that you would cleanse our minds and our souls through Jesus Christ's perfect sacrifice for our sins. And not just cleanse us of all unrighteousness, but lead us and guide us into all truth. Please put a hedge and a guard over our tongues and our mouths and our hearts and help us to be disciplined with self-control by the power of your Holy Spirit to do all that you've created us to do and to be all that you've created us to be and to speak something important, to speak those things in which are wise and of your word, and not to banter and have idle words with the world, but to speak that in which truly builds up, edifies, and brings sinners 
on to your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you, Father. Amen. We'll see you in the 18th chapter now, my friends. Lord willing, until then, amen.